this little couplet, if you like, uh, of the communion of the saints and the forgiveness of sins. And uh, just go on to the next one. I believe in the communion of saints and the forgiveness of sins. So we, we did first part one of this last week. We looked at the communion of, the, of saints. So what are saints? Well, saints, for some of us, we were brought up in a t- tradition that to be a saint, you had to be dead and do something special. But actually, the Bible teaches us that a saint is someone who just believes in Jesus. There were Old Testament saints, people who were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. But we are New Testament saints. So if you have given your life to Jesus, you're a saint. So then the question, well, are there saints in heaven? Well, yes, they are. Those who were saints on earth and that have died and gone on before us are saints who are now in heaven. Uh, and the Bible tells us that at the consummation of time, we will be there in heaven worshiping together with Old Testament saints, New Testament saints, those who maybe haven't even been born yet. It will be a great reunion and a great gathering. And so saints are our people who love the Lord, They could be in this church, they could be in another church in the city, they could be around the world. It's this communion of of believers who who are around the globe. And we've often, many of us have been places, and you bump into a Christian maybe from another nation, uh, and you think, wow, they just love Jesus the same way I do. Maybe they maybe love him more than I do. Uh, But there's a connection, and that's the communion of saints. That's the fellowship of saints. Now today we're going to look at this connection then. Here's, here's some of the saints. Last week we actually talked about the saint. Do, 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 do. No, okay, okay, Andy, I'll not do it. <laughs> we, we discovered who the old people were last week who remembered Simon Templer in black and white, the saint. And we actually had the music. And we had the do, 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 do. And uh, so, uh, but we want to look at the connection between the communion of saints and the forgiveness of sins because there's such a connection Uh, and whilst the apostles creed wasn't written by the apostles it's a gathering of the apostles teaching and truths from the scriptures Uh, and so it's interesting how they've layered the apostles creed and how these two are are together now of course if we live in a world where people don't talk about sin very much. Is that correct? So I thought, well, we better maybe find out what sin is before we, we can't forgive somebody something or be forgiven of something if we don't know what it is. So sin is an offense against God, either through neglect or conscious intent. So in, in other words, uh, the, the theologians call it sins of omission or sins of commission. And you maybe know the verse that the Apostle Paul said, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I do do. <laughs> that doesn't sound right, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever think, I should have been doing such and such. A th- I should have been helping that person or I should have been doing this. And you don't do it and then you feel weak, as the Bible says. Or you do something that you know rightly you shouldn't be doing. Well, one's a sin of omission, one's a sin of commission. And, and, and so we do it on purpose, even knowing and others, we, we know I should do that, but I really can't be bothered. And so sin, in its truest sense, is an offense against God, either through neglect or conscious intent. It's interesting that sin is always against God, but most of the time it happens against somebody horizontally. And I don't know if you met, most of you probably know the story of David. David, uh, was on his rooftop, and it was actually the first porn channel. He saw Bathsheba uh, bathing on a lower deck, uh, and so he thought, hmm, fancy her. Now, the problem was she was married, and her husband was a wonderful general and a faithful general in David's army. But anyway, David decided, well, so a sin of, he knew rightly, he knew it was wrong, but he took uh, Bathsheba, he slept with Bathsheba, she became pregnant. So the, the problem was, David thought, Phew, what about her husband? And uh, So then he plotted and planned. He said, bring him home for a week and then they'll think it's his baby. But this man was so faithful. He said, I'm not going to sleep with my wife because I'm so committed to God. I'm so committed to King David. I'm so committed to the battle. I want to keep myself battle ready. That's a bummer, isn't it, for David? Uh, and and uh, so David thought he had to come up with another cunning plan so he thought we'll put him right on the forefront of the battle and he'll get killed and that's what happened now that that's evil isn't it that that's sin and so 
we know the story. The prophet came and told them a story about this guy had a little lamb and somebody stole it and David was raging. Uh, and, and, but he said, well, you're, you're that man. You're the man. You took this man's wife. You, didn't, you dishonored him. And, but, and David said this. He said, it's against God and God only that I have sinned. Well, he sinned against himself. He sinned against his own wife. He sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Uriah. He sinned against everything he believed. But he said, it's against God and God only that I've sinned. Isn't that interesting? And so our sins very often are horizontal against someone, but actually God says they're against him. And so we're going to see that as we go through this. So that's sin in a nutshell. We could do three months on this subject, but anyway, that's it. So the, here's the words of Jesus. Jesus was very big on this whole subject of sin, repentance, fellowship of the saints, because he understood uh, a bit the bigger picture in a sense. So Matthew 6 says this, for if you forgive people, now look at this, their reckless and willful sins, not just some wee sins that made by mistake, but their willful and reckless sins, leaving and letting them go and giving up resentment. <sighs> Jesus, you always make things so difficult. Can you not make things a bit easier? Leave it. Let, leave it. Mary often said to me, I rhyme on about stuff. <laughs> so just, leave, just leave it. Just leave it. And so we need to leave it. We need to let it go. Let it go. <laughs> okay. We need to let them go. We need to give up resentment. Well, I'll leave it and let it go, but tell you I ain't going to hold a grudge and resentment for the rest of my day should it kill me. And it will. <laughs> Your heaven, so for if you forgive people their reckless and willful sins, leaving and letting them go and giving up resentment, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Oh, happy days. That's fair enough. But it's the next part of the verse is the big issue. But if you do not forgive others their reckless and willful sins, leaving and letting them go and giving up resentment, neither will your father forgive your sins. That's scary. That's heavy. That's something that really should catch our attention. We cannot afford to hold uh, whole stuff not let it go, have resentment, not forgive people because God is saying, now, I don't know where we go with that, but if God's not forgiven me my sins, I'm, there has to be trouble ahead. There may be trouble. <laughs> I'm in a singing mood today. That's all your fault. Andy. <laughs> An anointing of song has come upon me. I don't know what's right. I never do this. Uh, it's Johnny's fault. We blame Johnny for everything. Here's what the same verse says in the, the message. In prayer, this is just simplifies this so much. In prayer, there's a connection between what God does and what you do. You can't get forgiveness from God, for instance, without also forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from God's part. It's one of those Selah moments, isn't it, that they will tell, think in that or as I like to say, stick that in your pipe and smoke it. Well, you know, don't. We have an addiction course starting <laughs> September. You can go on that. But think, and th this is something we have to seriously think about. And so before we can have true communion and fellowship with God, we need to know his forgiveness. Isn't that right? Before we were saved, before we knew God, we may have thrown up the odd prayer, Lord, help me. But we didn't have true communion and fellowship with God. But when we met God, when we uh, ask the Lord to to when we repented and asked the Lord to save us, we then began to understand communion and fellowship with God. But before we can have true communion and fellowship with the saints, we need to be a forgiving people. So we can't have fellowship and communion with God if he hasn't forgiven us. And we can't have communion and fellowship with one another if we are not a forgiving people, if we keep holding grudges and resentment and all those things that we read about in, in the verse before. Because the cross, we've all had to come to the cross None of us are any better than one another. We looked at this little slide last week. The, the cross stands above us all who have come to know the Lord. It's a great leveler. We all are the same at the end of the day. So then Matthew 5, 
Jesus again touches the, the same subject. He said, here is an even harder truth. Anyone who is angry with his brother will be judged for his anger. Anyone who taunts his friend, speaks contemptuously of toward him, or calls him a loser, fool, or scum, will have to answer the high court. Now, it doesn't mean the high court down in Belfast. This was the, the Sanhedrin. This was the church court. This was, was coming before the, the religious leaders of the day. Anyone who calls his brother, brother a fool may find himself in the fires of hell. Therefore, you're, if you're bringing your offering to God and you remember that your brother is angry at you or holds a grudge against you, then leave your gift before the altar. Go to your brother, repent and forgive one another, be reconciled and then return to the, uh, the altar to offer your gift. Because as we've seen in the verses before, if we're holding a grudge, if we're not forgiven someday, we can bring our tithes, we can bring our offerings, we can bring whatever the gift was they were bringing. <clears throat> it's actually just a waste of a gift and a waste of time if we have stuff in our hearts against people. And so Jesus, this theme keeps coming throughout the New Testament. So I was going to get this for a, to put in a t-shirt until I read this verse. Uh, but uh, it says, welcome to Loserville, population U. And so <laughs> Jesus said, don't say that to people. <laughs> That's not nice and it's sinful. So uh, that's maybe just my sense of humor, which needs work done, obviously. Matthew 18, it says, if uh, again, Jesus coming with the same theme, if one of your brothers or sisters sins against you, go to him in private and tell him, Here's an interesting line. What you perceive to be uh, the what you perceive the wrong to be. Sometimes we think somebody has done something off of, on us, and they actually haven't. Sometimes people have done something on us, or or they think we have done something on them. And actually, you, I've I haven't the world's greatest eyesight, so I could walk up Bow Street, and somebody from this church could be on the other side of the road, and I wouldn't see them. They might just about see them. Somebody could go home and say, see that pastor of that church? He walked up that street and he never even spoke to me. What a terrible person. They could have perceived that I was blanking them, talk to the hand because the face ain't listening, or ignoring them, or what, maybe I just didn't see them. And so sometimes there are conflicts that we have. Sometimes there's things in our lives that we think, oh, that person needs to repent and apologize to me, and they don't even know that they, they have done anything. So we need to be careful what we perceive the wrong to be. Sometimes we need to have this conversation with people that Jesus is, is talking about here. So he said, if one of your brothers or sisters sins against you, go in private, tell them what you perceive the wrong to be. Don't ring four people that are friends. And you see that pastor? He walked past me up that street and he never even spoke to me. And, and so you know, come to me and tell me. Tell me I'm as blind as a bat and, and whatever. Uh, and so what... If he listens to you, you've won a brother. But sometimes he will not listen. If he does not listen, go back, take a friend or two friends with you. For as we have learned in Deuteronomy, every matter should be testified to by two or three witnesses. Then if your brother or sister still refuses to heed, you are to share that with uh, what you know with the entire church. And if your brother or sister still refuses to listen to the entire church, you are to cast out your unrepentant sibling and consider him no different from outsiders. Now, this is for serious stuff. This is for things that bring a bad testimony to a, a church. This is a, these, these are not just for little things that we make mistakes and we do things, we offend people. This, was for, this comes from Deuteronomy when there was a murder. Uh, if someone murdered someone, then you couldn't just go and accuse them. And so there's a whole background to this story. This is just not randomly put in here by Jesus. So Jesus said, there, there's things in life, if you have offense against your, your brother or your brother has an offense against, go and sort it out. Don't bring your gift to the altar. Go have a chat. Get, but if it's something that's serious and someone is embezzling or someone is, has done something very serious anyway, and you go and you, you approach them about it and say, no, I'm not repenting. I know what I've done, but too bad. Well, then Jesus said, actually, they need to be put out of the fellowship because they're bringing a, 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 a stain on the testimony of the church. So this is, this is a quite a serious, so this is how serious God takes this stuff. So as far as Jesus is concerned, it doesn't matter if you have something against someone or they have something against you. He wants it sorted. I think that's coming across in these verses, isn't it? 
Jesus is wanting it sorted because he knows the damage it does to us as individuals and to the church. You see, if we don't forgive someone, is that hurting them? Sometimes they don't even know they need forgiving. No, it's hurting me because it's the resentment that's eating me up and it's also affecting my relationship with God. So God knows how important it is to deal with these things. He goes on to tell this story about this gentleman who was forgiven a huge debt. This guy, uh, one translation talks uh, that you couldn't pay it back in 500 lifetimes. That's a lot of money. Uh, and so, but he came and he pleaded with the king and he said, please forgive me. And the king said, that's okay, I forgive you. I clear your debt, I let you off. But on his way from the presence of the king, he found this guy that owed him a few pounds. And he caught him and he said, I'm putting you in jail till you pay me the whole thing. This is the, the prelude to this story. So when this king, this master found out, it says, the master was very angry and put the servant in prison to be punished and delivered him to the tormentors or to the torturers until he could pay everything he owed. This king did what my heavenly father will do to you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Can we say that together? From your heart. Can we say it with a my in it? From my heart. So we can so we can forgive so I can say to Pauline, I forgive you. <laughs> is that from my heart? She doesn't need forgiving for him, by the way, this is just an example. I can say, Pauline, I, I, I really forgive you. Is that from my heart? I can say, I forgive you. It has to be a heart thing. So it's, this is not just a lip thing. This is a heart thing. God God is a, deals with the heart. God is more interested in our heart, first of all, than our words. Because he said, he'll, if we don't forgive from the heart, this is strong language. He will hand us over to the tormentors or the torturers. Now, th this is actually a good news message this morning, believe it or not. <laughs> Some of it doesn't sound that way. But here's here's... This might explain sometimes why we feel the way we do. I don't know if it sounds like a song, but I can't catch a tune, Andy. Uh, I could make, could you make, no, okay. Tormentors, torture, it means the word in the Greek means to have loss. You ever find when you are holding a grudge, when you're not forgiven some, you feel the loss? You think you're trying to have the other people, I'm not going to speak to you because you did this to me. You're, you're trying to make them feel lost, but you feel you've just lost a friend. You've just lost a buddy. You've just lost fellowship. You've just lost that. It's like toil. It's as if the weight of the world is, is on your shoulders. It's vexation. That's an old-fashioned word. It's not a word that we use that often. But it was. it's this bottom meaning that I just thought, uh, the last meaning that I just thought, wow, could this be a description of, the, uh, a description of depression? The notion of going to the bottom. Isn't that interesting? The notion doesn't necessarily mean you're going to the bottom. It's the notion, the feeling of going to the bottom. Sometimes we wonder why the country is full of people on tablets just to keep them. And I understand depression is a big subject. But some of the depression that we feel in our lives that is out there could be because we're not forgiving people. Now, the difficulty is some of those people are not even alive, but we can still forgive them from our heart. You see, we don't always have the opportunity. Jesus said, leave your gift at the altar, go and be reconciled to the person. Well, what happens if that person's dead? Well, you can still forgive them from the heart. And, and so for some of us, we need to forgive our mom or dad. It's maybe someone who abused us as, as a child because it's locking us up. It's keeping us locked uh, in that place of, of the notion of going to the bottom. Some, some people, I, hear, I hear people say, some, I just never seem to be get, a, get ahead in life. Every time I seem, seem as if I'm winning, something happens. Every time I'm stepping to that place where I think I'm getting it all together, everything just falls apart. The notion of going to the bottom. Could God, could it, God be in it? You know, we need to examine our hearts. This is why we have the prayer room after church. You know, after church, sometimes the Holy Spirit, many times the Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts when the, through the worship or in the message. 
That's an opportunity to go in and deal with those things. We don't want to carry these things any longer. We, don't, we want to rise to the top. We're called to be people of favor. We're called to be people of victory. We're called to be people who are free. The notion of going to the bottom, that's not a free statement. Sure, it's not. We've been singing about freedom, but the Bible tells us maybe this is sometimes why we have these things. Because we've been handed over to the tormentors, not by the devil, but by God because we haven't forgiven a brother or a sister. So we need to walk in that repentance and forgiveness. This is communion Sunday. We, we have communion usually once a month, sometimes at other times. And of course, we talk, this is the communion of the saints. And so when you mention communion, many times we think of the communion service or the, or the Lord's table. And so this is an important, this helps us gather all these thoughts together, help us to understand God's perspective, it's not about our perspective, sure it's not. We need to get God's perspective. And this is what it says in 1 Corinthians 10. We give thanks for the cup of blessing used in the Lord's Supper, which is a sharing, it's a participation, it's a fellowship in the blood of Christ. And for the bread, that the bread that we break is a sharing, participation, fellowship in the body of Christ. Now look at what it says here. Because there's one loaf of bread, we who are many, are one body, because we all share that one loaf. What's the picture here? The body of Christ, the church, this gathering of the saints is like a big giant loaf. And we're all crumbs. We're all part of that loaf. We all make up the loaf. So this is why we can't say, well, that's, I don't like those people over there, because they're part of who we are. They're part of, a, of what makes up the loaf. We can't say, well, I reject these Christians over here. No, because we're all one. We're one body. We saw that last week. We're one loaf. This is the picture in communion. And so it's a breaking. It's a picture of Christ's body that's broken. But it's also the picture of, of this great body of believers coming together. Hopefully you can see that. It's a little bit dark. So we have the, the, we have the wine that represents the blood of Jesus, represents our salvation, it's not different for Africans or for Indians or for Irish or for Polish or for Fijians. It's one blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses everyone. The Bible says we all came from every nation. Every person came from one uh, God. The, the bread that we partake of is this, this one represents this one loaf, this communion of saints around the world. It goes on to say this. We know this. We, we often read this and proclaim this. For every time we eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. For this reason, whoever eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the blood, body and blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself first, and in this way let him eat the bread and drink the cup. Now, a lot of people then, the problem here is they said, well, it says let a man examine himself. <clears throat> so people examine themselves and think of the, the bad week they've had and when they kick the dog or whatever. And, and then think then they don't partake. But the Bible says, examine yourself, repent, and then eat. Because it's not about your righteousness, it's about the righteousness of Christ. And so we need to understand this examination is so that we keep coming back to that place of repentance, of forgiveness, of humility, to the cross, remembering what Christ has done for us. A person should examine himself first, and this way let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. For the one who eats and drinks without careful regard for the body, eats and drinks judgment against himself. Well, that would be a very foolish thing to do, wouldn't it? You wouldn't eat a slice of ham. <coughs> we went away <coughs> for a few days, and I left uh, some chicken in the fridge, hoping that Lindsay would eat it, because I don't like waste. And the date is it's two days out of date and I tasted a wee bit of it last night think is that is that good enough still to eat and no even I wouldn't chance it and and so we wouldn't eat food that's with examine it first wouldn't we we would look at it we would check it out but the the Bible says this way for the one who eats and drinks without careful regard for the body eats and drinks judgment to themselves that is why look what it said this is I'm not making this up this is the Bible that is why many of you are weak and sick, and quite a few are dead. This is telling us that people have gone before their time because they didn't recognize 
this loaf, this Lord, the Lord's body. So this is a sign we're going to put up from now on for communion. Uh, <laughs> So this is a very strong warning, isn't it, that the Bible gives us? So firstly, we need to honor the Lord's physical body that he sacrificed on the cross. You see, we talk about the atonement. The atonement is for, for the forgiveness of our sins, for the healing of our bodies, for the peace of our mind. It's, it's that to give us wholeness, nothing broken, nothing missing. And that's, that's one part of what we do when we come to communion. But the other part, the second part, is we need to honor the Lord's spiritual body, which is the church. So you and I are recognized as the body. What does the Bible say? He's the head and we're the body. And so we need to forgive one another. We need to repent where we need to repent. We need to forgive from the heart. Because there's actually a health risk when we come to take communion. If we are not examining ourselves, humbly coming before the Lord and saying, Lord, if it wasn't for the cross... If it wasn't, I'm no better than anybody else. I may not have murdered anybody, but this is a level playing field for anybody. And I need to repent of my sins. And so not honoring and forgiving our brothers and sisters creates a blockage in our relationship with God. And opens the door to both spiritual and physical weakness, sickness, and death. Sometimes we wonder why we're struggling spiritually. Sometimes we wonder why we're struggling Physically, financially, in our, in our mind with, the, with depression, well, maybe we've been handed over to the tormentors. The great, this is the great thing about coming to communion. It's, a, it's almost like a, a resetting of our default in God. Every time we come, we're remembering what he has done. Every time we come, we're focusing intentionally on ourselves. Lord, forgive me. I repent of, of the sins in my life. You see, our sin has been forgiven. Past, present, and future. But there's still little sins in our lives. Remember Jesus said, mentioned this last week. <clears throat> when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, Peter said, wash all of me. He said, when a person's had a bath, they're already, they're saved. But sometimes when you're out in the world, your feet get dirty, your feet get dusty. And so we need to come and repent of those little things that, that hinder us in our fellowship uh, with one another and with God. We don't want spiritual death. We don't want physical death. We don't want sickness. We don't want those things that Jesus died on the cross to save us from. First John, beautiful scripture, one of my favorite scriptures. It says, if we say we have fellowship and communion with him and yet keep on walking in the darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, We have fellowship and communion with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that an amazing verse? Let's read that again. Can we read it out together? If we say we have fellowship and communion with him and yet keep on walking in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, We have fellowship and communion with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You see, this cleansing is a present tense, is an ongoing, as we walk in the light as he is in the light. As we have fellowship with God, as we have fellowship with one another, that blood is cleansing us on a moment by moment, a day by day. When we come together at times like this, it's given us an extra focus on things. But imagine if we kept walking in, in that freedom, kept walking in that light. What does the light do? It exposes sin, doesn't it? The light exposes sin. It exposes stuff that shouldn't be there. We have this wonderful freedom that we've been singing about this morning. This whole thing of, of the communion of the saints and the forgiveness of sins is such an important thing. We think, oh, it's just a creed. No, it's life giving if we understand it last slide communion with god and communion of saints along with forgiveness of sins brings light well we all want that don't we we all want revelation we all want light for whatever it is because light is about truth it's about revelation it may be about god it may be about the things of the spirit maybe how to do our job a better way it covers everything we all want life I don't think anybody wants to die before their time. We want to live out our days on earth, 
love it brings a love because that that you can't you, if if you're not holding grudges uh, against people if you're repenting well then there's a love that flows isn't there for us it's very hard to love someone you can't stand their guts as the bible says and that you're not forgiving and you're not repenting so it brings love and it brings longevity we want you know it says of most as your days so shall your strength be we want to have strength for every day that god gives us and we want to have every day that god has intended for us and we want to have it that it has light and life and love in it that's that's the christian life that's the good news that jesus came to die for each one of us that we could walk in unbroken fellowship with him and with one another if we put his principles into practice we're going to share communion now together we're going to take the bread and the wine. We're going to examine ourselves. We're not going to fall into the trap of condemnation because condemnation.